Welcome to the Soil CRC's Building Technical Capacity for Improved Soil Management webinar series. Soil Compaction, Identification and Management. In this video, Murdoch University Professor Dr. Richard Bell shares information about the causes, effects and a variety of management options for amending compacted soils in agricultural landscapes answering questions along the way in this thorough and broad-reaching webinar workshop. But let's just see how we go for time. I'd much prefer that we go through it slowly and deal with people's questions uh, rather than rush through it. And um, look, I, I do apologize. I prepared it more as a lecture and uh, I realized that for adult learning, that's not necessarily the best uh, approach, but um, um, I had this material, so it was easier for me to uh, use it. But we can uh, go through it as fast or as slow as you like. Um, the photograph is um, quite telling. Uh, this is a, a crop that's come up in the wheat belt, and you can see these uh, strips where uh, the crop is quite yellow, and that corresponds with uh, wheel tracks. So that's a really good illustration of um, a compaction issue in the soil and uh, presumably where the soil is compacted under the wheel tracks, um, the rainfall is not infiltrating and you're getting some temporary waterlogging and that's what causes the crop to yellow off. It doesn't always show up quite as neatly as that, but that's a, a visual indication of the sort of problem that water, of compaction. Uh, locally, there's a, quite a bit of good material that is available to read up on and um, learn some more. There's um, the soil guide, which is available from DPIRD. Um, uh, Jeff uh, Moore was the um, chief editor of that book. It's, um, I guess, uh, published or re revised in 2004, so um, it's... Um, perhaps getting a little bit old now, but I think it's still got really good uh, basic material in it that uh, is relevant to Western Australia. Um, secondly, um, Steve Davies and colleagues a little bit later put out a bulletin from DPIRD on subsurface compaction. So that's a bit more up to date. Um, also relevant is, um, uh, is Mr. 2013 on the control traffic farming technical manual that obviously uh, deals a bit with uh, subsoil compaction. And DPIRD had a publication called the report card in 2013, uh, where they uh, put together uh, what we know about the different land degradation issues in Western Australia, uh, where they occur, uh, how severe they are, and uh, there's an article in that on uh, subsoil compaction uh, led by Dan Carter. So what I'm going to uh, present draws from that, um, th those sources. So the key messages is that in the West, we do have um, soils that are quite susceptible to soil compaction and to pan formation. And it's been an issue around for last 30 years or more that we've been aware of. And it is important um, because the estimated loss of crop production is in the order of $330 million per year from that. Um, but there are technologies that have been developed. Um, deep ripping has been uh, around for quite a long time and more recently, the inversion ploughing technologies have become popular as well as uh, spading. Uh, so they're uh, engineering um, treatments to try and overcome compaction and they're obviously reasonably expensive. Importantly, with the spread of uh, controlled traffic, uh, we now have technologies to minimise the recompaction because without um, control traffic recompaction is going to occur within the space of another two, three, four years. So it's not a permanent solution, it's only a temporary solution. 
On uh, clay soils, there may also be some uh, role for gypsum in trying to uh, improve and stabilise soil aggregation. But soil structure and compaction is a process that damages soil structure. Soil structure is very dependent on organic matter. So uh, whatever we can do that helps to build up organic matter in the soil, retain organic matter in the soil, um, plays an important long-term role in um, resisting the effect of soil compaction, that is making the soil resilient to that, uh, those forces causing compaction. Um, and a lot of what we deal with in relation to compaction is on cropping soils. Um, but of course, it is an issue in horticulture as well um, and in livestock um, farms or in mixed farms where you've got stock movement and grazing and particularly in the winter, uh, that can also be a significant factor causing compaction because the soils are wet. Uh, from DeepHerd, uh, they have um, put out this uh, hazard assessment um, for compaction. And what it shows is that in the northeast and eastern, southeastern wheat belts are the areas where large proportions of the landscape are susceptible to compaction. Uh, other parts of the southwest, which have uh, moderate or low hazard, it doesn't mean that compaction is not of any concern. It just means a smaller proportion of the landscape is likely to be affected uh, as opposed to the areas that have high hazard. Uh, and that's just related to uh, landform. Um, when we talk about compaction, it is broadly within the context of hard layers in soils. And that's a, a bigger topic than just compaction, uh, because we know that lots of soils, uh, even under native vegetation, can be quite hard. Uh, lots of uh, uh, native soils have very dense um, subsoils with extremely high bulk densities in the subsoil. Um, so putting this into context of hard layers, hardness comes from packing. So just the way in which the sand, silt and clay packs together. So if you've got the right combination of sand and then silt that fits into the pores between the sand and then clay that fits in the smaller pores, then it can all bind together into a, a hard packing or hard setting type of condition. Um, that can be exacerbated by transient bonding. So when the clay, sand and silt pack together, they tend to bond together. But some of that is reversible. When the soil re-wets, it softens again. And I think most of us who have worked out in um, West Australian wheat belt have seen soils like that, and probably also in um, Victoria. Um, soils that are rock hard in summer when they're dry. Um, and then as soon as they wet up, they start to uh, soften. Um, there's also cementation. Uh, so this is where the sand, silt and clay are more permanently bonded together through compounds like iron oxides, aluminium oxides and silica. And that might be expressed in a, um, a silcrete pan, for example, which you often find in duplex soils uh, just at the top layer of the duplex um, B horizon. Uh, you often get quite a hard layer there from silcrete that is uh, bonded together, the, the clay particles. So that type of uh, permanent bonding um, is there regardless of whether the soil is wet or dry. So those are natural features. Um, also, we've got other natural processes that uh, cause hardening of the surface. There's what we call slaking and dispersion. Um, slaking occur is a tendency of all soils when they wet up because when you've got a dry soil and 
water uh, falls on the surface and it starts to soak in, uh, water starts to penetrate into the peds. And if there's any air trapped in those peds, as the water soaks further and further into the ped, it compresses the air that's trapped inside it. And in some non-resilient soils, uh, eventually the ped explodes. Um, the force of um, the pressure of the air that builds up within the ped um, is so strong that it just causes the, uh, the ped to collapse completely. And that's what's called slaking. So that commonly happens on soils uh, when they wet up um, with the first winter rains. And that's often expressed in a, a layer that's perhaps a few millimetres, five millimetres um, thick, which when it dries um, forms a, a hard crust on the surface. Uh, dispersion is a bit different. That's related to sodicity in the soil. So those soils, when they wet, they tend to disperse because of the uh, influence of the sodium. Uh, raindrops, when they hit the soil surface, have quite a lot of energy and uh, the impact of the raindrop itself can break down um, soil peds and uh, reduce the surface structure and lead to that crusting. Uh, loss of organic matter by any means, uh, usually by repeated cultivation, um, is a process that uh, uh, reduces the stability of soil structure. And uh, repeated wetting and drying can actually be a positive influence that helps to uh, reform, naturally reform soil structure. Um, then we've got the compaction. This is where there's uh, external load or the weight of machinery usually but also uh, animals, which compresses the soil depending on their water content. And um, so apart from the weight of the vehicles, which usually results in subsoil traffic pans or compaction, you've got the effect of cultivation itself, uh, which can lead to plough pans. Uh, we obviously see less of that nowadays in our uh, wheat belt in Western Australia because of uh, no till. Uh, and then there's the effect of uh, stock, stock trampling, which causes more surface compaction rather than subsurface compaction. So that's a bit of a framework to try and put it all together uh, under the banner of hard layers in soils. Um, I might just um, skip over that one. Uh, Felicity, I'll make this um, available. So if anyone wants to go through it later and uh, or anyone who's not here today wants to look at it later, um, it'll be there. So this table just summarizes and text some of the things that I talked about. So how are we going so far? Are there any questions that have popped up yet? Uh, no questions popped up yet, Richard. Okay. Why does it matter? Um, here's a, a set of data that um, really illustrates why compaction layers um, are really significant for uh, crops and pastures. And um, if you look at the uh, table at the bottom, this is from some old data with wheat that um, DPIRD did uh, for two different sites, East Chapman, which is up um, Near, near Geraldton and Wongan Hills, which is a couple of hours um, north uh, east of Perth. Um, the rate at which the roots grow through unripped and ripped soils can be very different. So in the ripped soil, uh, the wheat roots are growing at about 14 millimetres per day. So cent over a centimetre, almost a centimetre and a half per day. So they're really tearing through the profile where it was ripped, but in the unripped soil, they're only growing at about a third of that rate. Uh, which means that um, in the ripped soil, they can get much deeper. In the same amount of time, they can uh, penetrate to a much greater depth. So in this experiment, in the ripped soil, after 35 days, the roots were down to 60 centimetres, 50, 60 centimetres. 
where they can explore all of the water and the nutrients in that upper 50, 60 centimetres, as opposed to the unripped soil where they're still confined to the upper 20 or 30 centimetres. So they've just got basically half the water and nutrient resource uh, available to them. And the figure above just shows the, uh, the rate of penetration of uh, the roots through the ripped versus the unripped layer. So it's not that roots won't penetrate through some of these compacted layers, it's just that it takes them longer, slows them down, and they may never catch up. So um, even later in the season, uh, when the rain is drying up, uh, the ones that got through that uh, layer quickly and got their roots down much deeper uh, are just able to tap into subsoil moisture reserves, keep them going a little bit later. And we know one millimetre extra rainfall from the subsoil late in the season could be worth 40 or 50 kilograms extra grain per hectare. So um, a few extra millimetres of rainfall has a really noticeable effect on the bottom line. And these are some uh, yield increases from experiments done by DPIRD over the years. Some old work that uh, Bill Crabtree did um, in the 1980s, and then more recent work of Steve Davies, or Ron Jarvis, and then Steve Davies, and you can see uh, these are quite impressive improvements in yield, half a tonne or more. Um, and they're data sets that are based on lots of comparisons. So there's pretty robust data on uh, loamy sands and uh, other sands where you can get quite uh, significant boosts in yield with a deep ripping treatment on soils that have subsoil compaction. And Richard, was that um, was the depth of ripping um, was that specific to each um, soil uh, compaction depth? So, for example, um, yeah, were they were they ripped at the depth where the compaction um, depth was identified, or were they all just ripped at like twenty centimeters or thirty centimeters, or you know? Um, look, I uh, can't answer that specifically, but. The general guideline is that you would identify where the compaction layer is um, and make sure that you rip about 50% deeper than that. Um, and, um, but out of uh, 50 or 60 trials, I uh, couldn't be sure that uh, everyone did that diagnosis first um, before setting up the trial or whether they, um, um, you know, some did and some didn't. People like, well, people like Ron Jarvis and Steve Davies are pretty systematic and methodical, I'm sure. Um, uh, a lot of those trials would have been done by firstly digging a auger hole or a, a pit, uh, identifying where that compaction layer is, and, um, and making sure that the depth of uh, ripping exceeded the depth of compaction. And of course, you need to uh, do it at the right moisture as well. So if the soil is too moist, then you don't get the same fracturing and shattering and um, breaking up of that uh, layer. If the soil is too wet, it can be just like, the ripper can be like a, a hot knife through butter. So it does make a impression in the compacted layer, but only very localized, yeah. Is there, a, is there a guide for moisture levels for different soil types for ripping anywhere? Oh, look, um, in, in a, our climate, you've got a, a long period when the soil is um, dry and uh, you're most likely to get um, effective ripping on the sands. Of course, if you're dealing with clays, it might be a little bit different uh, where you might have to um, be a bit opportunistic and if you get some summer rainfall and subsoil moisture uh, ripping after that uh, might be easier to penetrate but um, still sufficiently uh, dry to get that fracturing and cracking happening. What, what's your experience over in Victoria? 
Um, yeah, I, I probably don't have enough um, knowledge to share in, in that respect, but um, certainly um, I went to a field day early in the year, probably in end of February, March. It was pretty – we had had a bit of rainfall during um, – February, um, and it, although it was pretty dry, uh, and uh, they were doing a deep ripping demonstration actually, and uh, it was get, coming up pretty cloddy, um, and it was pretty dusty as well. So yeah, similar um, to you, Richard, that balance between of getting a bit of moisture um, so that you don't end, um, so that you can yes get the shattering, but not so wet that you get that um, yeah. shearing. So. Yeah, look, Western Australia, we've probably done most ripping on sands or loamy sands, but there is interest in uh, ripping on clays. And uh, Nadine, are you still there? Um, I think um, up in uh, your area, they've been doing a bit of uh, ripping in clay soils. Do you want to uh, add anything to that? Hi, guys. Um, yeah, they haven't had great results and it has been very cloddy the paddocks I've seen. Um, and I know that Steve Davies is not super confident about it. But sort of the trials that he's done doesn't don't always show up real well either. So it's probably a risky move, but I think people are desperate for ideas and that's why they try it. Uh, that, that's my understanding as well, that um, um, it's uh, an area that we'll probably see a bit more work over coming years to see if... Um, the research can work out when it will be effective and cost effective and uh, when you should avoid it. And uh, obviously a lot of the clay soils have sodic subsoils in the southern wheat belt, also uh, high boron salinity. So those are issues that uh, you'd have to be pretty cautious about. And uh, uh, before a big investment, you'd need to be confident that it was going to leave you in a better shape than you were before. I did refer to soil structure before, and um, we're all familiar with soil texture, which is the percentages of sand, silt and clay. Uh, so those are what we call the primary soil particles, and that has a major influence on pore size distribution within the soil. So the proportion of macro pores that allow roots to grow through, uh, air to penetrate and uh, drainage, as opposed to the mesopores and micropores, which are the finer pores that will hold water and store water. Um, but soil structure is where the sand, silt and clay get reorganized into secondary particles, uh, which we sometimes call PEDs or aggregates. And the extent to which that happens in the soil um, uh, determines how well structured the soil is. Uh, now we have a lot of sands or sandy A horizons in Western Australia and sandy soils don't form good soil structure. Um, we do have in duplex soils and soils with clay um, horizons um, some structure formation but um, it, when we teach undergraduates in Western Australia, it's actually quite a difficult um, concept to teach because we just don't have a lot of soils with really well-formed structure. Uh, not like if you go to the Darling Downs of Queensland or um, some of the well-structured soils in Eastern Australia or some of the super well-structured tropical soils that I've seen. But um, the um, PEDs can have different shapes. Uh, the most common one in the A horizon would be this crumb structure or granular structure. And that's largely due to the influence of organic matter and clay. Uh, in the subsoil, particularly in duplex soils, you often get this columnar structure or prismatic structures. Um, but other structure or ped types that you might see are angular or polyhedral and platy type structures are something to look for as they often occur as a, an, a symptom of um, smearing or um, plow, uh, plow pans and uh, the, they may be evidence of uh, compaction. So 
how do PEDs or aggregates form? Well, it's where sand grains and uh, clay domains and organic matter together with polyvalent cations, so particularly calcium and aluminium, um, chemically they just bind together to form this uh, secondary structure. Uh, and when you look at the soil profile and you dig it up with a spade, uh, you'll often see these PEDs just sort of fall out of the uh, soil material. Uh, they have enough binding and coherence together to uh, form those PEDs and they change the pore size distribution of the soil. So on sands, they create more mesopores and micropores, so you get greater water holding. And on clays, they tend to break it up so that you get more macropores that allow better aeration and uh, drainage and uh, root penetration. Nadine's just asked, is there a simple farmer-friendly guidelines on what tests to check before ripping and what the thresholds are, especially for clay or loam soils that are more risky? Look, off the top of my head, um, I don't have an answer to that, um, but I can do a little bit of uh, searching and see if I can come up with something. Yeah, these are the sort of things, I guess, Nadine, that we were wanting to do out in the field um, and when we, had a, when we could get a soil pit. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, off the top of my head, thinking about things like um, those constraints, salinity, city, city, um, boron, those sort of things that um, yeah, Richard already mentioned, and I guess getting some thresholds. So considering what crop you might be growing next or what your crops you're planning on growing in the future um, and their tolerance to those sort of levels. Yeah, look, I think you'd probably assume if you're ripping a clay soil, you're going to bring up some clods from the subsoil. Mm -hmm. So you would want to be sure that there's nothing particularly nasty down there. Yeah. Because if you bring that up to the surface, then uh, you're just exacerbating the problem. Yeah. It'd be really good to, I guess, see a bit of a culture where people do check more. Um, I think that sometimes, like, oh, we'll just do a bit of ripping and see what happens. So be great to encourage more checking before digging somehow. Right, no checky, no learny. Right. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, um, a good mantra to keep repeating. <laughs> you, you can't manage what you haven't measured and um, uh, digging a hole uh, with an auger, with a spade, can tell you a lot about a soil profile. Um, yeah, okay, so it doesn't have to be a fancy test, just to dig with a shovel. Is sometimes a good idea? Uh, there's a lot you can see just from digging a hole and uh, looking at the profile. Um, if you go down to 50 centimetres or so, you can pick up a lot of the significant uh, aspects of the soil profile. But once you've done that, you may as well take a soil sample and uh, get it analysed as well. Yeah, I'm really big on that. You can't um, manage what you haven't measured. Um, and if you had, like Richard said, I mean, there's some field th things that you can do in the field. So even if you had um, a pH test kit that you could, um, you know, you just get them from Bunnings. So if you're looking below that, like at any incremental stage, um, you could do some um, pH. So you can have a look at whether it's increasing or decreasing to determine if you've got a, um, a pH constraint. Um, you could also do even the slaking and dispersion tests um, at depth. So, again, taking some little peds um, of soil and using rainwater and just popping them in. And I'll uh, um, put some video links um, when I send the videos, the, the link to this video. Um, I'll include some YouTube videos so you can have a look at the slaking and dispersion test. Um, but that will just give you an indication of any sodic issues at depth. Um, I think salinity is probably an issue that would be for you guys. So, but that's uh, a, a lab test. Um, I don't know of an in-field test for salinity, but if anybody else does, feel free to, to pipe up. Um, so they would be, yeah, a few tests. Um, Boron, if that is, I'm not sure of the boron issues that you guys might have over there, but um, we've certainly got some boron at depth um, in some of our clay soils uh, in Victoria. 
So yeah, I think they're just a, a couple of things, even the, just a texture test to give you an idea of um, what the texture is like at depth. So if it's getting sandier or if it's getting clayier. Um, yeah. And yeah, and Peter, yeah, there is, there could be a risk of bringing uh, up acidity from ripping. Uh, although, yeah, Richard, you might have a, a more experience in that. Is there a risk of bringing up acidity with ripping sandy soils or is it mostly yes. clays? Um, no, certainly on the sands, a lot of those have acid subsoils. So uh, um, a lot of farmers nowadays when they rip are uh, also liming and uh, using that as an opportunity to try and uh, incorporate lime and get it uh, down into the subsoil. And it might be combined with um, uh, spading, moldboard ploughing, one-way ploughing, just to get that incorporation of the lime while you're doing the, uh, uh, the ripping operation. Lucy, I wanted to add that um, I remember going to a workshop and that was just all about digging holes out in paddocks. And one of the things they always recommended was dig a hole under a fence line because that's where there isn't any traffic and you, you get a comparison of what the soil may have been like before it had chemicals and fertilisers and, and high traffic type situations. And even, you know, you don't get the same kind of stock traffic under the fence line so it makes a good comparison with where you are um, in your paddock versus to what it might have been prior to that. Yeah great Belinda good very excellent point yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah there's a few folk in uh, Deep Herd in Western Australia who are really good on this um, field diagnostics with um, pits, um, backhoe pits and the like. Um, Jeremy Lemon who's based in Albany I've seen Jeremy in the pit and, uh, you know, he's just really experienced and really good at being able to go through the uh, things to look for. Uh, and Steve Davies up at uh, Geraldton also is really good in that sort of uh, setting. So if you can get either of those people along, um, you get good value out of them. Yeah, great. Thank yeah, our last two field days we had some, yeah, soil pits and it was really good, but probably mm. need to keep doing it, I think. I think so. Too many soil pits. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I um, went to a, on a field uh, trip uh, years ago to a, a vineyard uh, near Ballarat, I think it was, and they just talked about how this vineyard had been established for over 20 years and try as they may, it just, the vines just struggled and hardly produced um, uh, any uh, fruit. Um, and they tried everything um, until they invited a soil scientist along. He said, can we get a backhoe and dig a pit and have a look at the profile? And what they found was that it, all the roots were in the top 30 centimetres and below 30 centimetres was just a really dense clay subsoil. Um, and um, they put a ripper through that and after that, the vines just took off and uh, thrived. So, you know, you can learn a lot from digging that hole and uh, you pick up the basic uh, constraints. There may be some other things that are a bit more um, tricky to diagnose uh, or where you need to do a soil test as well, but um, don't underestimate the value of that soil pit or uh, looking underneath your feet. Okay, uh, just a little bit more about soil structure. Uh, roots themselves, as they grow through, uh, they do help to um, create soil structure. Uh, firstly, by the pressure that it, they create that um, pushes particles together, as well as the uh, organic matter that, um, uh, or, or organic compounds that roots excrete, uh, all of that helps to create a a biological environment for uh, uh, building soil structure. Um, the key with soil structure, apart from the clay, is the organic matter and its activity in the soil. Uh, and it's not just a matter of having the organic matter there, it needs to be turning over and uh, producing um, gels and gums that microbes produce, and that helps with the, uh, the binding together of the clay, sand, and the cations. 
Um, I mentioned wetting and drying. Um, uh, wetting can have a negative effect on structure where you get slaking, uh, but it also has a positive effect on structure because as the soil dries, the particles actually rearrange and come closer together, which uh, in increases the bonding between the uh, sand, silt and clay and organic matter. Um, that happens more with some soils than others and some clay soils are quite uh, self-repairing as they dry, the structure reforms. Um, we don't have a lot of those sort of soils in Western Australia, but in Eastern Australia they do. Uh, not so relevant in our environment, but freezing and thawing is a process that can help um, reform soil structure. And tillage, um, we think mostly of the negative effects of tillage on soil structure, but you can get some, if you till soils when they're not too wet or too dry, you can actually get some uh, beneficial influence on uh, forming soil structure. And the photograph there on the right just shows a, a clay subsoil and you can see the, the way in which it's cracked and fractured. Uh, and that's the indication of the peds, which in that particular soil are, are reasonably large peds. Um, so the importance of soil structure and maintaining the soil structures around drainage, having enough macro pores so that water will actually drain, excess water will drain through the profile. Uh, secondly, you get storage of water uh, in the peds for dry periods. Uh, thirdly, that there's enough macro pores that air can penetrate through the soil and provide the aeration for roots and microorganisms. And uh, finally, for uh, root growth itself. Um, you have to remember that uh, roots are delicate biological structures. They're not like a, a metal rod that just sort of jams its way through the soil. They actually have to find pores that are about the same diameter as the tip of the root to actually grow into the pore. So if you don't have enough of those uh, macro pores, it's difficult for the roots to actually uh, penetrate, penetrate through those layers. Although in Western Australia, what we often find in these uh, soils that have a dense B horizon, that the roots will tend to penetrate through old root channels. Uh, and these old root channels might have uh, existed from the native vegetation. Um, they may have partly filled in, but uh, they remain sufficiently open that successive generations of crop and pasture roots will uh, um, regrow through those uh, same uh, channels. Uh, here's an old table from a standard soil physics textbook, just showing how the plant available soil water contents can be improved if you've got good structure. So regardless of the texture, if there's good soil structure with plenty of PEDS, you can increase the uh, amount of plant available water quite substantially. Um, <clears throat> the things that I'm going to focus mostly now on subsoil compaction. Um, and subsoil compaction comes from three main processes, uh, compression, shearing and smearing. So, and compression is probably the main one that we now focus on, particularly in the broadacre agriculture. And that's just the weight of machinery and animals causing a vertical force, uh, which is transmitted into the soil and uh, um, and uh, causes the particles to settle closer together. But if you've got um, um, wheel tracks and spinning or slipping of um, uh, the wheels uh, or the tires of uh, vehicles, that can cause uh, shearing, which is another form of compaction. Um, and um, smearing, particularly when we did a lot of tillage, um, the tillage tines, or if it's uh, rotary tillage, um, the force of those um, causes smearing of the soil. And this photograph on the 
right hand side is actually one from Bangladesh um, where we're using really small machines. And this is a what's called a strip tillage where you've got uh, the rotating blades uh, that have been pulled through that soil to try and uh, open up a slot to place the seed and fertilizer. And you can see the soil was just far too wet and it's just caused that uh, smearing along the side. And once the, the clay on that smeared layer starts to dry, it sets rock hard. And what we were finding is that uh, the seeds that we were placing in that uh, slot, uh, the roots just weren't able to penetrate out of that smeared zone. It was so hard and uh, impenetrable that the crop grew very, very poorly. In the subsoil or the subsurface, there's two main types of compaction. Uh, one is the plough pans and the other is traffic pans. So the plough pan is where you've got uh, repeated tillage at the same depth. Um, and that causes um, smearing uh, to, towards the base of where that tillage layer is that over year, uh, year after year, uh, just forms this uh, quite dense layer. Often there's quite distinct boundaries between the upper and lower part of that uh, smeared layer so that when you look at the profile, you can often see that uh, as quite a distinct uh, layer. Now that would have been very, very common in our wheat belt um, 30 years ago when everyone was uh, plowing two or three times a year to uh, establish crops with no till. Uh, it's not such a big issue, but uh, even with no till, um, if you're going in when the soil is too wet, uh, the knife points and the other points can lead to uh, a degree of uh, smearing. Uh, the main, uh, but there are many other forms of uh, agriculture and horticulture that still do ploughing. So, uh, so the plough pans there are issues that uh, you need to be uh, um, familiar with and aware of. Then the traffic pans, these mostly come from just the compression of the weight of um, machinery um, that uh, leads to a layer of very high strength, normally 10 to 40 centimetres into the soil profile. And that is more common in um, sandy and uh, loamy soils than it is in um, uh, other textured soils. Uh, this is a indication of the different pressures that uh, animals and uh, machinery can cause. And um, you can see that um, horses and cows under their hooves can actually create the same amount of pressure that uh, a large tractor does. Um, with sheep and humans and small tractors, the, uh, the pressure is not quite as much. And the Compaction in these um, layers is very much influenced not just by weight, but also by the number of passes. And it's a cumulative sort of thing. Um, one pass, you get um, a degree of compaction. Uh, five passes, you can see that the compaction is uh, spreading deeper. And uh, 15 passes, you can see that it's uh, spread quite deep into the profile, um, 75, 80 centimetres or more. Um, and even the very compacted layer might still be going down to uh, 30 or 40 centimetres. And you can often see those uh, compaction layers. So here's a photograph from uh, one of the DPIRD publications, I think taken by Steve Davies. And in that uh, photograph, you can actually see this very distinct compaction layer uh, in a soil that um, is probably a sandy loam texture. So in that layer, you've got a decrease in pore size, volume, and also decrease in pore continuity. So it's difficult for roots to penetrate, uh, difficult for roots to access water and nutrients in that layer or below it. And you may also get uh, increase in some of the harmful path pathogens as a result of uh, those compaction layers. 
Uh, this is from one of the DPIRD publications, which indicate these subsoil compaction layers probably form more in the loamy sand and sandy loam, sandy clay loam textures than uh, other textures. How do you measure it? Um, don't underestimate field observations. That photograph I showed earlier, um, you can often see that as plain as day uh, when you dig a hole and you don't need anything more fancy than the hole to uh, show that there's a problem. Uh, another way is um, penetration resistance using a penetrometer such as shown in the photograph here. Um, do need to be aware that uh, the penetration resistance is influenced by moisture. So you should wet up the soil, let it drain for 24 or 48 hours first before taking the measurement. Um, otherwise, uh, dry soils will always have much higher penetration resistance than uh, wet soils. And uh, if you've got variation in moisture from site to site or measurements taken um, in summer versus uh, winter, then it will be largely due to the moisture rather than due to the inherent compaction within the soil itself. And then the other one is uh, soil bulk density, uh, which is taken with a core of known vol volume, which you then uh, weigh to determine how much soil is in that volume. Seems really easy, but actually there's a bit of um, technique involved in collecting good soil bulk density data. Question was asked earlier about um, with penetration resistance, uh, what's the magic number? So uh, here's an example of a penetration resistance in a profile. Um, on the right hand side is the um, unripped soil. And you can see that at 20 centimeters or so, the uh, penetration resistance goes above three megapascals. Um, and where it's ripped, um, that has uh, reduced the penetration resistance at that 20 centimetre layer to less than half a megapascal. Um, basically at three megapascals, roots will stop growing. Um, at about 1.7 megapascals, they will definitely slow down. Um, and we often use two as a, uh, a threshold. So if you've got um, subsoils with um, penetration resistance above two, you really need to uh, act on it because it's going to be having significant effect on uh, uh, roots. The other question was uh, what's, what sort of bulk densities are problematic? And it does vary a bit with texture. So in a sand, anything above uh, 1.65 is restricting growth, above 1.85 will stop growth. Uh, in the case of uh, lo uh, clay loam soils, they can uh, they uh, require lower bulk density in order to get uh, good uh, root penetration. So look, I think I might leave it there. Um, there's a few other slides. Um, control traffic is obviously uh, a great breakthrough in terms of um, maximizing the value of deep ripping because otherwise uh, within two or three years uh, soils will recompact. Um, in Western Australia, I think currently we reckon 25-30% of farmers are in control traffic. There are parts of um, central highlands of Queensland where I think it's probably 70 or 80% of farmers are into control traffic, but I think that's rapidly changing and um, would be more in the northern region where Nadine works than uh, in the southern wheat belt. Um, and that's about trying to get the percentage of the soil that is actually compacted by traffic down to about 10% um, compared to uh, um, random trafficking where it might be more than 40% of the soil in one season is getting the effect of compaction. So look, I'm going to uh, wrap up there. There's a Jeremy Lemon uh, looking at a, um, a backhoe pit 
and uh, taking people through the diagnosis of pH, compaction, where the roots are to try and work out what's the problem in this particular field that the farmer needs to uh, focus on uh, in order to get um, uh, the best return from investment in uh, overcoming soil constraints. So thanks for your time, thanks for listening and um, sorry we didn't get quite all the way through that but um, hopefully that's uh, something useful for you. Thank you for watching. If you found this information useful, there are many more related projects to discover at our website. Please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more Soil CRC webinars, project updates and conference presentations. This webinar series was produced by the Soil CRC, jointly funded through the Australian Government's National Land Care Program to build the technical capacity of natural resource management agencies, land care and grower groups to deliver soil health information to farmers for improved soil management. For more information about our projects, visit soilcrc.com.au.